Section 1 of The Corsair. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Corsair, A Tale, by George Gordon, Lord Byron. Canto 1, Stanza 1 to 7. Nessun maggior dolore che ricordarsi del tempo felice nella miseria. Dante. One. O'er the glad waters of the dark blue sea, our thoughts as boundless and our souls as free. Far as the breeze can bear, the billows foam. Survey our empire and behold our home these are our realms no limits to their sway our flag the sceptre all who meet obey ours the wild life in tumult still to range from toil to rest and joy in every change oh who can tell not thou luxurious slave whose soul would sicken o'er the heaving wave not thou vain lord of wantonness and ease whom slumber soothes not pleasure cannot please oh who can tell save he whose heart hath tried and danced in triumph o'er the waters wide the exulting sense the pulse's maddening play that thrills the wanderer of that trackless way that for itself can woo the approaching fight and turn what some deem danger to delight that seeks what cravens shun with more than zeal and where the feebler faint can only feel feel to the rising bosom's inmost core its hope awaken and its spirit soar no dread of death if with us die our foes save that it seems even duller than repose come when it will we snatch the life of life when lost what wrecks it by disease or strife let him who crawls enamoured of decay cling to his couch and sicken years away heave his thick breath and shake his palsied head ours the fresh turf and not the feverish bed while gasp by gasp he falters forth his soul ours with one pang one bound escapes control his course may boast its urn and narrow cave and they who loathe his life may gild his grave ours are the tears though few sincerely shed when ocean shrouds and sepulchres are dead for us even banquets fond regret supply in the red cup that crowns our memory and the brief epitaph in danger's day when those who win at length divide the prey and cry remembrance saddening o'er each brow how had the brave who fell exalted now two such were the notes that from the pirate's isle around the kindling watchfire rang the while such were the sounds that thrilled the rocks along and unto ears as rugged seemed a song in scattered groups upon the golden sand they game carouse converse or wet the brand select the arms to each his blade assign and careless eye the blood that dims its shine repair the boat replace the helm or oar while others straggling muse along the shore for the wild bird the busy springes set or spread beneath the sun the dripping net gaze where some distant sail a speck supplies with all the thirsting eye of enterprise tell all the tales of many a night of toil and marvel where they next shall seize a spoil no matter where their chief's allotment this theirs to believe no prey nor plan amiss 
but who that chief his name on every shore is famed and feared they ask and know no more with these he mingles not but to command few are his words but keen his eye and hand ne'er seasons he with mirth their jovial mess but they forgive his silence for success ne'er for his lip the purpling cup they fill that goblet passes him untasted still and for his fare the rudest of his crew would that in turn had passed untasted too earth's course is bred the garden's homeliest roots and scarce the summer luxury of fruits his short repast in humbleness supply with all a hermit's board would scarce deny but while he shuns the grosser joys of sense his mind seems nourished by that abstinence steer to that shore they sail do this tis done now form and follow me the spoil is won thus prompt his accents and his actions still and all obey and few enquire his will to such brief answer and contemptuous eye convey reproof nor further deign reply three a sail a sail a promised prize to hope her nation flag how speaks the telescope no prize alas but yet a welcome sail the blood-red signal glitters in the gale yes she is ours a home returning bark blow fair thou breeze she anchors ere the dark already doubled is the cape our bay receives that prow which proudly spurns the spray how gloriously her gallant course she goes her white wings flying never from her foes she walks the waters like a thing of life and seems to dare the elements to strife who would not brave the battle-fire the wreck to move the monarch of her people deck for horse o'er her side the rustling cable rings the sails are furled and anchoring round she swings and gathering loiterers on the land discern her boat descending from the latticed stern tis manned the oars keep concert to the strand till grates her keel upon the shallow sand hail to the welcome shout the friendly speech when hand grasps hand united on the beach the smile the question and the quick reply and the heart's promise of festivity five the tidings spread and gathering grows the crowd the hum of voices and the laughter loud and woman's gentler anxious tone is heard friends husbands lovers names in each dear word oh are they safe we ask not of success but shall we see them will their accents bless for where the battle roars the billows chafe they doubtless boldly did but who are safe but let them haste to gladden and surprise and kiss the doubt from these delighted eyes six where is our chief for him we bear report and doubt that joy which hails our coming short yet thus sincere tis cheering though so brief but juan instant guide us to our chief our greeting paid we'll feast on our return and all shall hear what each may wish to learn ascending slowly by the rock-hewn way to where his watch-tower beetles o'er the bay by bushy brake and wild flowers blossoming and freshness breathing from each silver spring whose scattered streams from granite basins burst leap into life and sparkling woo your thirst from crag to cliff they mount near yonder cave 
what lonely straggler looks along the wave in pensive posture leaning on the brand not oft a resting staff to that red hand tis he tis conrad here as won't alone on juan on and make our purpose known the bark he views and tell him we would greet his ear with tidings he must quickly meet we dare not yet approach thou know'st his mood when strange or uninvited steps intrude seven him one sort and told of their intent he spake not but a sigh expressed assent these wan calls they come to their salute he bends him slightly but his lips are mute these letters chief are from the greek the spy who still proclaims our spoil or peril nigh whate'er his tidings we can well report much that peace peace he cuts their prating short wondering they turn abashed while each to each conjecture whispers in his muttering speech they watch his glance with many a stealing look to gather how that eye the tidings took but this as if he guessed with head aside perchance from some emotion doubt or pride he read the scroll my tablets juan hark where is gonsalvo in the anchored bark there let him stay to him this order bear back to your duty for my course prepare myself this enterprise to-night will share to-night lord conrad ay at set of sun the breeze will freshen when the day is done my corslet cloak one hour and we are gone sling on thy bugle see that free from rust my carbine lock springs worthy of my trust be the edge sharpened of my boarding brand and give its guard more room to fit my hand this let the armourer with speed dispose last time it more fatigued my arm than foes mark that the signal gun be duly fired to tell us when the hour of stays expired End of section one read by alan mapstone section two of the corsair by george gordon lord byron this librivox recording is in the public domain canto one stanzas eight to thirteen eight they make obeisance and retire in haste too soon to seek again the watery waste yet they repine not so that conrad guides and who dare question aught that he decides that man of loneliness and mystery scarce seen to smile and seldom heard to sigh whose name appalls the fiercest of his crew and tints each swarthy cheek with sallower hue still sways their souls with that commanding art that dazzles leads yet chills the vulgar heart what is that spell that thus his lawless train confess and envy yet oppose in vain what should it be that thus their faith can bind the power of thought the magic of the mind linked with success assumed and kept with skill that moulds another's weakness to its will wields with their hands but still to these unknown makes even their mightiest deeds appear his own such hath it been shall be beneath the sun the many still must labor for the one tis nature's doom but let the wretch who toils accuse not hate not him who wears the spoils oh if he knew the weight of splendid chains how light the balance of his humbler pains nine unlike the heroes of each ancient race demons in act 
but God's at least in face. In Conrad's form seems little to admire, though his dark eyebrow shades a glance of fire. Robust but not Herculean, to the sight no giant frame sets forth his common height. Yet in the whole, who paused to look again, saw more than marks the crowd of vulgar men. They gaze and marvel how, and still confess that thus it is, but why they cannot guess. Sun burnt his cheek, his forehead high and pale, the sable curls in wild profusion veil, and oft perforce his rising lip reveals the haughtier thought it curbs but scarce conceals. Though smooth his voice and calm his general mien, still seems there something he would not have seen. His features deepening lines and varying hue, at times attracted yet perplexed the view. As if within that murkiness of mind worked feelings fearful and yet undefined. Such might it be, that none could truly tell. Too close inquiry his stern glance would quell. There breathe but few whose aspect might defy the full encounter of his searching eye. He had the skill, when cunning's gaze would seek, to probe his heart and watch his changing cheek. At once the observer's purpose to espy, and on himself roll back his scrutiny, lest he to Conrad rather should betray some secret thought than drag that chief's to-day. There was a laughing devil in his sneer that raised emotions both of rage and fear, and where his frown of hatred darkly fell, hope withering fled, and mercy sighed farewell. 10. Slight are the outward signs of evil thought. Within, within, twas there the spirit wrought. Love shows all changes, hate, ambition, guile, betray no further than the bitter smile. The lips least curl, the lightest paleness thrown, along the governed aspect speak alone of deeper passions, and to judge their mean, he who would see must be himself unseen. Then with the hurried tread, the upward eye, the clenched hand, the pause of agony, that listens, starting, lest the step too near approach intrusive on that mood of fear. Then, with each feature working from the heart, with feelings loose to strengthen, not to part, that rise, convulse, contend that freeze or glow, flush in the cheek or damp upon the brow, then, stranger, if thou canst, and tremblest not, Behold his soul, the rest that soothes his lot. Mark how that lone and blighted bosom sears the scathing thought of execrated years. Behold, but who hath seen, or e'er shall see, man as himself, the secret spirit free. 11. Yet was not Conrad thus by nature sent to lead the guilty, guilt's worst instrument. His soul was changed, before his deeds had driven him forth to war with man and forfeit heaven. Warped by the world in disappointment school, in words too wise, in conduct there a fool. Too firm to yield, and far too proud to stoop, doomed by his very virtues for a dupe. He cursed those virtues as the cause of ill, and not the traitors who betrayed him still, nor deemed that gifts bestowed on better men had left him joy and means to give again. Feared, shunned, belied, ere youth had lost her force, he hated man too much to feel remorse, and thought the voice of wrath a sacred call to pay the injuries of some on all. He knew himself a villain, but he deemed 
the rest no better than the thing he seemed, and scorned the best as hypocrites who hid those deeds the bolder spirit plainly did. He knew himself detested, but he knew the hearts that loathed him crouched and dreaded too. Lone, wild, and strange, he stood alike exempt from all affection and from all contempt. His name could sadden and his acts surprise, but they that feared him dared not to despise. Man spurns the worm, but pauses ere he wake the slumbering venom of the folded snake. The first may turn, but not avenge the blow. The last expires, but leaves no living foe. Fast to the doomed offender's form it clings, and he may crush, not conquer, still it stings. 12. None are all evil, clinging round his heart, one softer feeling would not yet depart. Oft could he sneer at others as beguiled by passions worthy of a fool or child. Yet gainst that passion vainly still he strove, and even in him it asks the name of love. Yes, it was love, unchangeable, unchanged, felt but for one from whom he never ranged. Though fairest captives daily met his eye, he shunned nor sought, but coldly passed them by. Though many a beauty drooped in prisoned bower, none ever soothed his most unguarded hour. Yes, it was love, if thoughts of tenderness, tried in temptation, strengthened by distress, unmoved by absence, firm in every clime, and yet, oh, more than all, untired by time, which nor defeated hope nor baffled wile could render sullen were she near to smile, nor rage could fire, nor sickness fret to vent on her one murmur of his discontent, which still would meet with joy, with calmness part, lest that his look of grief should reach her heart, which not removed, nor menaced to remove. If there be love in mortals, this was love. He was a villain, I. Reproaches shower on him, but not the passion, nor its power, which only proved all other virtues gone, not guilt itself could quench this loveliest one. 13. He paused a moment, till his hastening men passed the first winding downward to the glen. Strange tidings! Many a peril have I passed nor know I why this next appears the last. Yet so my heart forebodes, but must not fear, nor shall my followers find me falter here. Tis rash to meet, but surer death to wait, till here they hunt us to undoubted fate, and if my plan but hold, and fortune smile, will furnish mourners for our funeral pile. Ay, let them slumber, Peaceful be their dreams, morn ne'er awoke them with such brilliant beams as kindle high to-night. But blow, thou breeze, to warm these slow avengers of the seas. Now to Medora, O oh, my sinking heart, long may her own be lighter than thou art. Yet was I brave, mean boast, where all are brave, even insects sting, for aught they seek to save. This common courage, which with brutes we share, that owes its deadliest efforts to despair, small merit claims, but t'was my nobler hope to teach my few with numbers still to cope. Long have I led them, not to vainly bleed. No medium now, we perish or succeed. So let it be. It irks not me to die, but thus to urge them whence they cannot fly. My lot hath long had little of my care, but chafes my pride thus baffled in the snare. Is this my skill, my craft, to set at last hope, power, and life upon a single cast? O oh, fate, accuse thy folly, not thy fate. She may redeem them still, 
nor yet too late. End of section two. Read by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa, in September of 2022. Section three of the Corsair by George Gordon, Lord Byron. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Canto one, stanza fourteen through seventeen. Stanza fourteen. Thus with himself communion held he, till he reached the summit of his tower crowned hill. There at the portal paused, for wild and soft. He heard those accents never heard too oft. Through the high lattice far yet sweet they rung, And these the notes his bird of beauty sung. Deep in my soul that tender secret dwells, Lonely and lost to light forevermore, Save when to thine my heart responsive swells, Then trembles into silence as before. Then in its centre a sepulchral lamp burns the slow flame eternal but unseen which not the darkness of despair can damp though vain its ray as it had never been remember me o oh, pass not thou my grave without one thought whose relics there recline the only pang my bosom dare not brave must be to find forgetfulness in time my fondest faintest latest accents here Greet for the dead not virtue can reprove, Then give me all I ever asked, a tear, The first, last, sole reward of so much love. He passed the portal, crossed the corridor, And reached the chamber as the strain gave o'er, My own Medora, sure thy song is sad, In Conrad's absence wouldst thou have it glad, Without thine ear to listen to my lay? Still must my song, my thoughts, my soul betray, Still must each accent to my bosom suit, My heart unhushed, although my lips were mute. Oh, many a night on this lone couch reclined, My dreaming fear with storms hath winged the wind, And deemed the breath that faintly fanned thy sail, The murmuring prelude of the ruder gale. Though soft, it seemed the low prophetic dirge that Mourn thee floating on the savage surge. Still would I rise to rouse the beacon fire, Lest spies less true should let the blaze expire. And many a restless hour outwatched each star, And morning came, and still thou wert afar. Oh, how the chill blast on my bosom blew, And day broke dreary on my troubled view. And still I gazed and gazed, and not a prow was granted to my tears my truth my vow at length twas noon i hailed and blessed the mast that held my sight it neared alas it passed another came o oh god twas thine at last would that those days were over wilt thou ne'er my conrad learn the joys of peace to share sure thou hast more than wealth and many a home as bright as this invites us not to roam Thou knowest it is not peril that I fear. I only tremble when thou art not here. Then, not for mine, but that far dearer life Which flies from love and languishes for strife. How strange that heart, to me so tender still, Should war with nature and its better will. Yea, strange indeed, thou heart hath long been changed, Warm-like, t'was trampled, at her like avenged, without one hope on earth beyond thy love, and scarce a glimpse of mercy from above. Yet the same feeling which thou dost condemn, my very love to thee is hate to them, so closely mingling here that disentwined I cease to love thee when I love mankind. Yet dread not this, the proof of all, the past assures the future that my love will last. But, O oh, Medora, Nerve thy gentler heart this hour again, But not for long, we part. This hour we part, my heart foreboded this, Thus ever fade my fairy dreams of bliss. This hour it cannot be, this hour away. Yon bark hath hardly anchored in the bay, Her consort still is absent, And her crew have 
need of rest before they toil anew my love thou mockest my weakness and wouldst steal my breast before the time when it must feel but trifle now no more with my distress such mirth hath less of play than bitterness be silent conrad dearest come and share the feast these hands delighted to prepare light toil to cull and dress thy frugal fare see i have plucked the fruit that promised best and were not sure perplexed but pleased i guessed at such as seemed the fairest thrice the hill my steps have wound to try the coolest rill yes thy sherbet to-night will sweetly flow see how it sparkles in its vase of snow the grapes gay juice thy bosom never cheers thou more than moslem when the cup appears think not i mean to chide for i rejoice what others deem a penance is thy choice but come the board is spread our silver lamp is trimmed and heeds not the sirocco's damp then shall my handmaids while the time along and join with me the dance or wake the song or my guitar which still thou lovest to hear shall soothe or lull or should it vex thine ear will turn the tale by ariosto told of fair olympia loved and left of old why thou wert worse than he who broke his vow to that lost damsel shouldst thou leave me now or even thy traitor chief i've seen thee smile when the clear sky showed ariadne's isle which i have pointed from these cliffs the while and thus half sportive half in fear i said lest time should raise that doubt to more than dread thus conrad too will quit me for the main and he deceived me for he came again again and oft again my love if there be life below and hope above he will return but now the moments bring the time of parting with redoubled wing the why the where what boots it now to tell since all must end in that wild word farewell yet would i fain did time allow disclose fear not these are no formidable foes and here shall watch a more than wanted guard for sudden siege and long defence prepared nor be thou lonely though thy lords away or matrons and thy handmaids with thee stay and this thy comfort that when next we meet security shall make repose more sweet list tis the bugle wan shrilly blew one kiss one more another oh adieu she rose she sprung she clung to his embrace till his heart heaved beneath her hidden face he dared not raise to his that deep blue eye that downcast drooped in tearless agony her long fair hair lay floating o'er his arms and all the wildness of dishevelled charms scarce beat that bosom where his image dwelt so full that feeling seemed almost unfelt hark peals the thunder of the signal gun it told twas sunset and he cursed that sun again again that formed he madly pressed which mutely clasped imploringly caressed and tottering to the couch his bride he bore one moment gazed as if to gaze no more felt that for him earth held but her alone kissed her cold forehead turned is conrad gone stanza fifteen and is he gone on sudden solitude how oft that fearful question will intrude twas but an instant past and here he stood and now without the portal's porch she rushed and then at length her tears in freedom gushed big bright and fast unknown to her they fell but still her lips refused to send farewell for in that word that fatal word howe'er we promise hope believe there breathes despair or every feature of that still pale face had sorrow fixed what time can ne'er erase the tender blue of that large loving eye grew frozen with its gaze on vacancy till oh how far it caught a glimpse of him and then it flowed and frenzied seemed to swim through those long dark and glistening lashes dewed with drops of sadness off to be renewed he's gone 
against her heart that hand is driven convulsed and quick then gently raised to heaven she looked and saw the heaving of the main the white sail set she dared not look again but turned with sickening soul within the gate it is no dream and i am desolate stanza sixteen from crag to crag descending swiftly sped stern conrad down nor once he turned his head but shrunk whene'er the windings of his way forced on his eye what he would not survey his lone but lovely dwelling on the steep that hailed him first when homeward from the deep and she the dim and melancholy star whose ray of beauty reached him from afar on her he must not gaze he must not think there he must rest but on destruction's brink yet once almost he stopped and nearly gave his fate to chance his projects to the wave but no it must not be a worthy chief may melt but not betray to woman's grief he sees his bark he notes how fair the wind and sternly gathers all his might of mind again he hurries on and as he hears the clang of tumult vibrate on his ears the busy sounds the bustle of the shore the shout the signal and the dashing oar as marks his eye the sea-boy on the mast the anchors rise the sails unfurling fast the waving kerchiefs of the crowd that urge that mute adieu to those who stem the surge and more than all his blood-red flag aloft he marvelled how his heart could seem so soft fire in his glance and wildness in his breast he feels of all his former self possessed he bounds he flies until his footsteps reach the verge where ends the cliff begins the beach there checks his speed but pauses less to breathe the breezy freshness of the deep beneath than there his wonted statelier step renew nor rush disturbed by haste to vulgar view for well had conrad learned to curb the crowd by arts that veil and oft preserve the proud his was the lofty port the distant mean that seems to shun the sight and awes if seen the solemn aspect and the high-born eye that checks low mirth but lacks not courtesy all these he wielded to command assent but where he wished to win so well unbent that kindness cancelled fear in those who heard and other gifts showed mean beside his word when echoed to the heart as from his own his deep yet tender melody of tone but such was foreign to his wonted mood he cared not what he softened but subdued the evil passions of his youth had made him value less who loved than what obeyed stanza seventeen around him mustering ranged his ready guard before him wan stands are all prepared they are nay more embark the latest boat waits but my chief my sword and my capote soon firmly girded on and lightly slung his belt and cloak were o'er his shoulders flung col pedro here he comes and conrad bends with all the courtesy he deigned his friends receive these tablets and peruse with care words of high trust and truth are graven there double the guard and when anselmo's bark arrives let him alike these orders mark in three days serve the breeze the sun shall shine on our return till then all peace be thine this said his brother pirate's hand he wrung then to his boat with haughty gesture sprung flashed the dipped oars and sparkling with the stroke around the waves phosphoric brightness broke they gain the vessel on the deck he stands shrieks the shrill whistle ply the busy hands he marks how well the ship her helm obeys how gallant all her crew and deigns to praise his eyes of pride to young gonsalvo turns why doth he start and inly seem to mourn alas those eyes beheld his rocky tower and live a moment o'er the parting hour she his madora did she mark the prow ah never loved he half so much as now but much must yet be done ere dawn of day again he mans himself and turns away 
down to the cabin with gonzalvo bends and there unfolds his plans his means and ends before them burns the lamp and spreads the chart and all that speaks and aids the naval art they to the midnight watch protract debate to anxious eyes what hour is ever late meantime the steady breeze serenely blew and fast and falcon-like the vessel flew past the high headlands of each clustering isle to gain their port long long ere morning smile and soon the night-glass through the narrow bay discovers where the pasha's galleys lay count they each sail and mark how there supine the lights in vain or heedless moslem shine secure unnoted conrad's prow passed by and anchored where his ambush meant to lie screened from espial by the jutting cape that rears on high its rude fantastic shape then rose his band to duty not from sleep equipped for deeds alike on land or deep while leaned their leader o'er the fretting flood and calmly talked and yet he talked of blood end of canto one end of section three Section 4 of The Corsair by George Gordon, Lord Byron. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Stevens. Canto 2, stanzas 1 to 5. Conoceste i dubiosi desiri, Dante. In Coron's bay floats many a galley light. Through Coron's lattices the lamps are bright. For seed the pasha makes a feast to-night, a feast for promised triumph yet to come, when he shall drag the fettered rovers home. This hath he sworn by Allah and his sword, and faithful to his firman and his word. His summoned prows collect along the coast, and great the gathering crews, and loud the boast, already shared the captives and the prize, though far the distant foe they thus despise. Tis but to sail, no doubt, to-morrow's sun, will see the pirates bound, their haven won. Meantime the watch may slumber, if they will, nor only wake to war, but dreaming kill. Though all who can disperse on shore, and seek to flesh their glowing valour on the Greek, how well such deed becomes the turbaned brave to bear the sabre's edge before a slave infest his dwelling but forbear to slay their arms are strong yet merciful to-day and do not deign to smite because they may unless some gay caprice suggests the blow to keep in practice for the coming foe revel and rout the evening hours beguile, and they who wish to wear a head must smile, for Muslim mouths produce their choicest cheer, and hoard their curses till the coast is clear. High in his hall reclines the turbaned seed, around the bearded chiefs he came to lead, removed the banquet and the last pilaf, Forbidden draughts, tis said, he dared to quaff. Though the rest the sober berries juice, The slaves bear round for rigid Muslims' use. The long chibuque's dissolving cloud supply, While dance the amas to wild minstrel's eye. The rising morn will view the chiefs embark, But waves are somewhat treacherous in the dark and revellers may more securely sleep on silken couch than o'er the rugged deep. Feast there who can, nor combat till they must, and less to conquest than to Koran's trust. And yet the numbers crowded in his host might warrant more than even the pasha's boast. With cautious reverence from the outer gate, Slow stalks the slave, whose office there to wait, Bows his bent head, 
his hand salutes the floor, ere yet his tongue the trusted tidings bore. A captive dervis from the pirate's nest, escaped, is here, himself would tell the rest. He took the sign from Said's assenting eye, and led the holy man in silence nigh. His arms were folded on his dark green vest, his step was feeble, and his look depressed. Yet worn he seemed of hardship more than years, and pale his cheek with penance, not from fears, vowed to his God his sable locks he wore, and these his lofty cap rose proudly o'er. Around his form his loose long robe was thrown, and wrapped a breast bestowed on heaven alone. Submissive, yet with self-possession manned, he calmly met the curious eyes that scanned, and question of his coming fain would seek before the pasha's will allowed to speak. Whence come thou, Dervis? From the outlaw's den. A fugitive? Thy capture? Where and when? From Scanlover's port to Sio's isle. The sake was bound, but Allah did not smile upon our course, the Muslim merchant's gains. The rovers won, our limbs have worn their chains. I had no death to fear, nor wealth to boast, beyond the wandering freedom which I lost. At length a fisher's humble boat by night afforded hope and offered chance of flight. I seized the hour and find my safety here with thee, most mighty Pasha, who can fear? How speed the outlaws! Stand they well prepared, their plundered wealth and robber's rock to guard? Dream they of this our preparation, doomed to view with fire their scorpion nest consumed? Pasha, the fettered captive's mourning eye that weeps for flight, but ill can play the spy. I only heard the reckless waters roar, whose waves that would not bear me from the shore. I only marked the glorious sun and sky, too bright, too blue for my captivity, and felt that all which freedom's bosom cheers must break my chain before it dried my tears. This mayest thou judge, at least, from my escape, they little deem of aught in peril's shape. Else vainly had I prayed or sought the chance that leads me here, if eyed with vigilance. The careless guard that did not see me fly may watch as idly when thy power is nigh. Pasha, my limbs are faint, and nature craves food for my hunger, rest from tossing waves. Permit my absence. Peace with thee, peace with all around. Now grant repose, release. Stay, Dervis, I have more to question. Stay, I do command thee, sit, dust here, obey. More I must ask, and food the slave shall bring. Thou shalt not pine where all are banqueting. The supper done, prepare thee to reply, clearly and full. I love not mystery. Twere vain to guess what shook the pious man, who looked not lovingly on that divan, nor showed high relish for the banquet pressed, and less respect for every fellow guest. Twas but a moment's peevish hectic passed along his cheek and tranquillized as fast. He sat him down in silence, and his look resumed the calmness which before forsook. The feast was ushered in, but sumptuous fare he shunned, as if some poison mingled there. For one so long condemned to toil and fast, methinks he strangely spares the rich repast. What ails thee, Dervis? Eat. Dost thou suppose this feast a Christian's, or my friends thy foes? Why dost thou shun the salt, that sacred pledge, which, once partaken, blunts the sabre's edge? 
makes even contending tribes in peace unite, and hated hosts seem brethren to the sight. Salt seasons dainties, and my food is still the humblest root, my drink the simplest rill, and my stern vow and order's laws oppose to break or mingle bread with friends or foes. It may seem strange, if there be aught to dread, that peril rests upon my single head, but for thy sway, nay more, thy sultan's throne, I taste nor bread nor banquet, save alone. Infringed our order's rule, the prophet's rage, to Mecca's dome might bar my pilgrimage. Well, as thou wilt, ascetic as thou art, one question answer, then in peace depart. How many? Ha! It cannot sure be day. What star, what sun is bursting on the bay? It shines a lake of fire. Away, away! Ho! Oh, treachery! My guards, my scimitar! The galleys feed the flames, and I afar. Accursed Dervis, these thy tidings. Thou, some villain, spy, seize, cleave him, slay him now. Up rose the Dervis with that burst of light, nor less his change of form appalled the sight. Up rose that Dervis, not in saintly garb, but like a warrior bounding from his barb, dashed his high cap and tore his robe away, shone his mailed breast and flashed his sabre's ray. His close but glittering casque and sable plume more glittering eye and black brow's sabler gloom glared on the Muslim's eyes some afrit sprite, whose demon death blow left no hope for fight. The wild confusion and the swarthy glow of flames on high and torches from below, the shriek of terror and the mingling yell, for swords began to clash and shouts to swell, flung o'er that spot of earth the air of hell, distracted to and fro the flying slaves, behold but bloody shore and fiery waves. Nought heeded they the pasha's angry cry, they seize that dervis, seize on Zatanai. He saw their terror, checked the first despair that urged him but to stand and perish there, since far too early and too well obeyed. The flame was kindled ere the signal made. He saw their terror, from his baldric drew his bugle, brief the blast, but shrilly blew. Tis answered, well ye speed, my gallant crew. Why did I doubt their quickness of career, and deem design had left me single here? Sweeps his long arm, that sabre's whirling sway sheds fast atonement for its first delay, completes his fury what their fear begun, and makes the many basely quail to one. The cloven turbans o'er the chamber spread, and scarce an arm dare rise to guard its head. Even Said, convulsed, o'erwhelmed with rage, surprise, retreats before him, though he still defies, no craven he, and yet he dreads the blow, so much confusion magnifies his foe. His blazing galleys still distract his sight, he tore his beard, and foaming fled the fight, for now the pirates passed the harem gate, and burst within, and it were death to wait, where wild amazement shrieking, kneeling, throws the sword aside, in vain the blood o'erflows. The corsairs pouring haste to where within invited Conrad's bugle and the din of groaning victims and wild cries for life proclaimed how well he did the work of strife. They shout to find him grim and lonely there, a glutted tiger mangling in his lair, but short their greeting, shorter his reply. "'Tis well, but seed escapes, and he must die. Much hath he done, 
but more remains to do. Their galleys blaze. Why not their city, too? Quick at the word they seized him, each a torch, and fire the dome from minaret to porch. A stern delight was fixed in Conrad's eye, but sudden sank, for on his ear the cry of women struck, and like a deadly knell, knocked at that heart, unmoved by battle's yell. Oh, burst the harem, wrong not on your lives, one female form, remember, we have wives, on them such outrage vengeance will repay, man is our foe, and such tis ours to slay, but still we spared, must spare the weaker prey, oh, I forgot, but heaven will not forgive, if at my word the helpless cease to live, follow who will, I go, we yet have time, our souls to lighten of at least a crime. He climbs the crackling stairs, he bursts the door, nor feels his feet glow scorching with the floor, his breath choked gasping with the volumed smoke, but still from room to room his way he broke. They search, they find, they save with lusty arms, each bears a prize of unregarded charms, Calm their loud fears, sustain their sinking frames, With all the care defenceless beauty claims, So well could Conrad tame their fiercest mood, And check the very hands with gore imbrued. But who is she whom Conrad's arms convey From reeking pile and combat's wreck away? Who but the love of him he dooms to bleed, the harem queen, but still the slave of seed. End of section four. Section five of the Corsair by George Gordon, Lord Byron. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto two, stanzas six through ten. Six. Brief time had Conrad now to greet Gulner, few words to reassure the trembling fair. For in that pause compassion snatched from war, the foe before retiring fast and far, with wonder saw their footsteps unpursued, first slowlier fled, then rallied, then withstood. This seed perceives, then first perceives how few, compared with his, the corsair's roving crew, and blushes o'er his error as he eyes the ruin wrought by panic and surprise. Allah il Allah! Vengeance swells the cry. Shame mounts to rage that must atone or die, and flame for flame and blood for blood must tell the tide of triumph ebbs that flowed too well. When wrath returns to renovated strife, and those who fought for conquest strike for life. Conrad beheld the danger, he beheld his followers faint by freshening foes repelled. One effort, one, to break the circling host. They form, unite, charge, waver, all is lost. Within a narrower ring compressed, beset, hopeless, not heartless, strive and struggle yet. Ah, now they fight in firmest file no more, Hemmed in, cut off, cleft down and trampled o'er. But each strikes singly, silently and home, And sinks outwearied rather than o'ercome. His last faint quittance rendering with his breath, Till the blade glimmers in the grasp of death. 7. But first ere came the rallying host to blows, And rank to rank, and hand to hand oppose, Gulner and all her harem handmaids freed, safe in the dome of one who held their creed, by Conrad's mandate safely were bestowed, and dried those tears for life and fame that flowed. And when that dark-eyed lady, young Gulner, recalled those thoughts late wandering in despair, much did she marvel o'er the courtesy that smoothed his accents, softened in his eye. "'Twas strange, 
That robber thus with gorbedewed seemed gentler than than seed in fondest mood. The pasha wooed as if he deemed the slave must seem delighted with the heart he gave. The corsair vowed protection soothed a fright, as if his homage were a woman's right. The wish is wrong, nay worse for female vain, yet much I long to view that chief again, if but to thank for what my fear forgot, the life my loving lord remembered not. 8. And him she saw, where thickest carnage spread, but gathered breathing from the happier dead, far from his band, and battling with the host, that deem right dearly won the field he lost. Felled, bleeding, baffled of the death he sought, and snatched to expiate all the ills he wrought, preserved to linger and to live in vain, while vengeance pondered o'er new plans of pain, and staunched the blood she saves to shed again, but drop by drop for seed's unglutted eye, would doom him ever dying, ne'er to die. Can this be he, triumphant late she saw, when his red hand's wild gesture waved a law? Tis he indeed, disarmed but undepressed, his soul regret the life he still possessed, his wounds too slight, though taken with that will, which would have kissed the hand that then could kill. O oh, were there none, of all the many given, to send his soul he scarcely asked to heaven, must he alone of all retain his breath, who more than all had striven and struck for death? He deeply felt what mortal hearts must feel, when thus reversed on faithless fortune's wheel, for crimes committed and the victor's threat of lingering tortures to repay the debt, he deeply, darkly felt. But evil pride that led to perpetrate now serves to hide. Still in his stern and self-collected mien, a conqueror's more than captive's heir is seen. Though faint with wasting toil and stiffening wound, but few that saw so calmly gazed around. Though the far shouting of the distant crowd, their tremors o'er, rose insolently loud, the better warriors who beheld him near insulted not the foe who taught them fear, and the grim guards that to his durance led in silence eyed him with a secret dread. 9. The leech was sent, but not in mercy, there, to note how much the life yet left could bear. He found enough to load with heaviest chain, and promise feeling for the wrench of pain. Tomorrow, yea, tomorrow's evening sun will sinking see impalement's pangs begun, and rising with the wonted blush of morn, behold how well or ill those pangs are born. Of torments this the longest and the worst, which adds all other agony to thirst, that day by day death still forbears to slake, while famished vultures flit around the stake. O oh, water, water! Smiling hate denies the victim's prayer, for if he drinks, he dies. This was his doom. The leech, the guard were gone, and left proud Conrad fettered and alone. 10. T'were vain to paint to what his feelings grew, it even were doubtful if their victim knew. There is a war, a chaos of the mind, when all its elements convulsed, combined, lie dark and jarring with perturbed force, and gnashing with impenitent remorse, that juggling fiend who never spake before, but cries, I warned thee when the deed is o'er. Vain voice, the spirit burning but unbent, may writhe, rebel, the weak alone repent. Even in that lonely hour when most it feels, and to itself all, all that self reveals, no single passion and no ruling thought, that leaves the rest as once unseen, unsought, but the wild prospect when the soul reviews, all rushing through their thousand avenues, 
ambition's dreams expiring, love's regret, endangered glory, life itself beset, the joy untasted, the contempt or hate, gainst those who fain would triumph in our fate, the hopeless past, the hasting future driven, too quickly on to guess if hell or heaven. Deeds, thoughts, and words, perhaps remembered not so keenly till that hour but ne'er forgot. Things light or lovely in their acted time, but now to stern reflection each a crime. The withering sense of evil unrevealed, not cankering less because the more concealed. All, in a word, from which all eyes must start, that opening sepulchre the naked heart bears with its buried woes till pride awake to snatch the mirror from the soul and break i pride can veil and courage brave it all 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 before beyond the deadliest fall each hath some fear and he who least betrays the only hypocrite deserving praise not the loud recreant wretch who boasts and flies but he who looks on death and silent dies. So steeled by pondering o'er his far career, he halfway meets him should he menace near. End of section 5 Read by Geoffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa, in October of 2022
True tis to him my life and more I owe, And me and mine he spared from worse than woe. Tis late to think, but soft his slumber breaks, How heavily he sighs, he starts, awakes. He raised his head and dazzled with the light, His eye seemed dubious if it saw aright, he moved his hand, the grating of his chain, Too harshly told him that he lived again. What is that form, if not a shape of air? Methinks my jailer's face shows wondrous fair. Pirate, thou knowest me not, but I am one, Grateful for deeds thou hast too rarely done. Look on me, and remember her, thy hand, Snatched from the flames, and thy more fearful band. It came through darkness, and I scarce know why, Yet not to hurt, I would not see thee die. If so, kind lady, thine the only eye, That would not hear in that gay hope delight, Theirs is the chance, and let them use their right, But still I thank their courtesy or thine, That would confess me at so fair a shrine. Strange though it seem, yet with extremest grief, Is linked a mirth, it doth not bring relief, That playfulness of sorrow near beguiles, Smiles in bitterness, but still it smiles, And sometimes with the wisest and the best, Till even the scaffold echoes with their jest, Yet not the joy to which it seems akin, It may deceive all hearts, save that within. Whate'er it was that flashed on Conrad now, A laughing wildness half and bent his brow, And these his accents had a sound of mirth, As if the last he could enjoy on earth. Yet gainst his nature, for through that short life, Few thoughts had he to spare from gloom and strife. 14. Corsair, thy doom is named, But I have power to soothe the patcher in his weaker hour, Thee would I spare, nay more, would save thee now, But this time hope, nor even thy strength allow, But all I can, I will, at least delay, The sentence that remits thee scarce a day, More now were ruin, even thyself were loath, The vain attempt should bring but doom to both. Yes, loath indeed, my soul is nerved to all, Or fallen too low to fear a further fall, Tempt not thyself with peril, me with hope, a flight from foes with whom I could not cope, and fit to vanquish, shall I merely fly, the one of all my band that would not die, yet there is one to whom my memory clings, till to these eyes her own wild softness springs. My sole resources in the path I trod were these, my bark, my sword, my love, my god, the last I left in youth he leaves me now, and man but works his will to lay me low, I have no thought to mock his throne with prayer, wrung from the coward crouching of despair. It is enough, I breathe, and I can bear. My sword is shaken from the worthless hand, that might have better kept so true a brand. My bark is sunk or captive, but my love, for her in sooth my voice would mount above. Oh, she is all that still to earth can bind, and this will break a heart so more than kind, and blight a form, till thine appeared. Gulner, mine eye ne'er asked if others were so fair. Thou lovest another then, but what to me is this tis nothing, nothing e'er can be, and yet thou lovest, and oh, I envy those whose hearts on hearts as faithful can repose, who never feel the void, the wandering thought, that sighs o'er visions such as mine had wrought. Lady, he thought thy love was his, for whom this arm redeemed thee from a fiery tomb. My love stern seeds, oh, no, no, not my love, Yet much this heart, that strives no more, once strove, To meet his passion, but it would not be, I felt, I feel, love dwells with, with the free, I am a slave, a favoured slave at best, To share his splendour, and seem very blest, Oft must my soul the question undergo, Of, dost thou love? And burn to answer, no, Oh, hard is it, that fondness to sustain, And struggle not to feel a verse in vain, But hard is still the heart's recoil to bear, and hide from one, perhaps another there. He takes the hands I give not, nor withhold, its pulse nor checked, nor quickened, calmly cold, and when resigned it drops a lifeless weight from one I never loved enough to hate, no warmth these lips returned by is impressed, and chilled remembrance shudders o'er the rest. Yes, had I ever proved that passion's zeal, the change to hatred were at last to feel, but still he goes unmourned, returns unsought, and oft on present, absent from my thought, or when reflection comes and when it must, I fear that henceforth it will but bring disgust. I am his slave, but, in despite of pride, twere worse than bondage to become his bride. Oh, that his dotage of his breast would cease, or seek another and give mine release. But yesterday I could have said, to peace, yes, if unwanted fondness now I feign, 
Remember, captive, tis to break thy chain, repay the life that to thy hand I owe, to give thee back to all endeared below, who share such love as I can never know. Farewell, morn breaks, and I must now away, to cost me dear, but dread no death to-day. 15. She pressed his fettered fingers to her heart, and bowed her head, and turned her to depart. And noiseless as a lovely dream is gone, and was she here, and is he now alone? What gem hath dropped and sparkles o'er his chain, the tear most sacred shed for others is pain, that starts at once, bright, pure, from pity's mine, already polished by the hand divine. Oh, too convincing, dangerously dear, in woman's eye the unanswerable tear, that weapon of her weakness can she wield, to save, subdue, at once her spear and shield. Avoid it, virtue ebbs and wisdom errs, too fondly gazing on that grief of hers, what lost a world, and bade a hero fly, the timid tear in Cleopatra's eye, yet be the soft triumvir's fault forgiven, by this, how many lose not earth but heaven, consign their souls to man's eternal foe, and seal their own despair some wanton's woe. 16. Tis morn, and o'er his altered features play, the beams without the hope of yesterday, what shall he be ere to-night? Perchance a thing, o'er which the raven flaps her funeral wing, by his closed eye and heeded and unfelt, while sets that sun, and dews of evening melt, chill, wet, and misty round each stiffened limb, refreshing earth, reviving all but him. End of Canto 2 End of Section 6 Read by Inko Section 7 of The Corsair by George Gordon Lord Byron This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Larry Wilson Canto 3 Come vedi aneor non m'abandons Dante 1 Slow sinks, more lovely ere his race be run, Along Morea's hills the setting sun. Not as in northern climes, obscurely bright, But one unclouded blaze of living light. O'er the hush deep the yellow beam he throws, Gilds the green wave that trembles as it glows. On old Aegina's rock and Idra's isle, The god of gladness sheds his parting smile. O'er his own regions lingering loves to shine, Though there his altars are no more divine. Descending fast, the mountain shadows kiss thy glorious gulf, unconquered Salamis. Their azure arches through the long expanse more deeply purpled meet his mellowing glance, and tenderest tints along their summits driven mark his gay course and own the hues of heaven, till darkly shaded from the land and deep behind his Delphian cliff he sinks to sleep. On such an eve his palest beam he cast, when Athens, here thy wisest looked his last, how watched thy better sons his farewell ray that closed their murdered sages' latest day. Not yet, not yet soul pauses on the hill. The precious hour of parting lingers still, but sad his light to agonizing eyes and dark the mountains once delightful thighs. Gloom o'er the lovely land he seemed to pour, the land where Phoebus never frowned before. But ere he sunk below Cithron's head, the cup of woe was quaffed, the spirit fled. The soul of him who scorned to fear or fly, who lived and died as none can live or die. But lo, from high Hymettus to the plain, the queen of night asserts her silent reign. No murky vapor, herald of the storm, hides her fair face, nor girds her glowing form. With cornice glimmering as the moonbeams play, there the white column greets her grateful ray, and bright around with quivering beams beset, her emblem sparkles o'er the minaret. The groves of olives scatter dark and wide, where meek Cephasus pours his scanty tide, the cypress saddening by the sacred mosque, the gleaming turret of the great kiosk and done the sombre mid the holy calm near theseus fane yon solitary palm 
all tinged with varied hues arrest the eye and dull were his that passed them heedless by again the aegean heard no more afar lulls of chafed breast from elemental war again his waves in milder tints unfold their long array of sapphire and of gold mixed with the shades of many a distant isle that frown where gentler oceans seem to smile two not now my theme why turn thou thoughts to thee o oh, who can look along thy native sea nor dwell upon thy name whate'er the tale so much its magic must o'er all prevail who that beheld that sun upon thee set fair athens could thine evening face forget not he whose heart nor time nor distance frees spellbound within the clustering cyclades nor seems this homage foreign to his strain his corsair's isle was once thine own domain would that with freedom it were thine again three the sun hath sunk and darker than the night sinks with its beam upon the beacon height medora's heart the third day's come and gone with it he comes not sins not faithless one the wind was fair though light and storms were none last eve anselmo's bark returned and yet his only tidings that they had not met though wild as now far different were the tale had conrad waited for that single sail the night breeze freshens she that day had passed in watching all that hope proclaimed to mast sadly she sate on high impatience bore at last her footsteps to the midnight shore and there she wandered heedless of the spray that dashed her garments oft and warned away she saw not felt not this nor dared depart nor deemed it cold her chill was at her heart till grew such certainty from that suspense his very sight had shocked from life or sense it came at last a sad and shattered boat whose inmates first beheld whom first they sought some bleeding all most wretched these the few scarce knew they how escaped this all they knew in silence darkling each appeared to wait his fellow's mournful guess at conrad's fate something they would have said but seemed to fear to trust their accents to medora's ear she saw at once yet sunk not trembled not beneath that grief that loneliness of lot within that meek fair form were feelings high that deemed not till they found their energy while yet was hope they softened fluttered wept all lost that softness died not but it slept and o'er its slumber rose that strength which said with nothing left to love there's naught to dread tis more than nature's like the burning might delirium gathers from the fever's height silent you stand nor would i hear you tell what speak not breathe not for i know it well yet would i ask almost my lip denies the a oh, quick your answer tell me where he lies lady we know not scarce with life we fled but here is one denies that he is dead he saw him bound and bleeding but alive she heard no further twas in vain to strive so throbbed each vein each thought till then withstood her own dark soul these words at once subdued she totters falls and senseless had the wave perchance but snatched her from another grave but that with hands though rude yet weeping eyes they yield such aid as pity's haste supplies dash o'er her death-like cheek the ocean dew raise fan sustain till life returns anew awake her handmaids with the matrons leave that fainting form o'er which they gaze and grieve 
then seek anselmo's cavern to report the tale too tedious when the triumph short four in that wild council words waxed warm and strange with thoughts of ransom rescue and revenge all save repose or flight still lingering there breathed conrad's spirit and forbade despair whate'er his fate the breasts he formed and led will save him living or appease him dead woe to his foes there yet survive a few whose deeds are daring as their hearts are true end of section seven Section 8 of The Corsair by George Gordon, Lord Byron. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto 3, stanzas 5 through 12. 5. Within the harem's secret chamber sat stern seed still pondering o'er his captive's fate. His thoughts on love and hate alternate dwell. Now with Gulner, and now in conrad's cell here at his feet the lovely slave reclined surveys his brow would soothe his gloom of mind while many an anxious glance her large dark eye sends in its idle search for sympathy his only bends in seeming o'er his beads but inly views his victim as he bleeds pasha the day is thine and on thy crest Sits triumph, Conrad taken, fallen the rest. His doom is fixed, he dies, and well his fate Was earned yet much too worthless for thy hate. Methinks a short release, for ransom told, With all his treasure not unwisely sold. Report speaks largely of his pirate hoard. Would that of this my pasha were the lord. While baffled, weakened by this fatal fray, Watched, followed, he were then an easier prey. But once cut off, the remnant of his band Embark their wealth and seek a safer strand. Gulner, if for each drop of blood a gem Were offered rich as Stamboul's diadem, If for each hair of his a massy mine Of virgin ore should supplicating shine, if all our Arab tales divulge or dream of wealth were here, that gold should not redeem. It had not now redeemed a single hour, but that I know him fettered in my power, and thirsting for revenge I ponder still on pangs that longest rack and latest kill. Nay, Seed, I seek not to restrain thy rage, too justly moved for mercy to assuage. My thoughts were only to secure for thee his riches. Thus released, he were not free. Disabled, shorn of half his might and band, his capture could but wait thy first command. His capture could, and shall I then resign one day to him, the wretch already mine? Release my foe, at whose remonstrance thine fair suitor, to thy virtuous gratitude, that thus repays this jower's relenting mood, which thee and thine alone of all could spare. No doubt, regardless if the prize were fair, my thanks and praise alike are due, now hear. I have a counsel for thy gentler ear. I do mistrust thee, woman, and each word of thine stamps truth on all suspicion heard. Born in his arms through fire from yon serai, Say, wert thou lingering there with him to fly? Thou needst not answer. Thy confession speaks, Already reddening on thy guilty cheeks. Then, lovely dame, bethink thee, and beware, Tis not his life alone may claim such care. Another word, and nay, I need no more. Accursed was the moment when he bore thee from the flames, which better far, but no. I then had mourned thee with a lover's woe. Now tis thy lord that warns, deceitful thing, 
Knowst thou that I can clip thy wanton wing? In words alone I am not wont to chafe. Look to thyself, nor deem thy falsehood safe. He rose and slowly, sternly thence withdrew. Rage in his eye and threats in his adieu. Ah, little wrecked that chief of womanhood, Which frowns ne'er quelled nor menaces subdued. And little deemed he what thy heart, ghoul ne'er, When soft could feel and when incensed could dare. His doubts appeared to wrong, nor yet she knew how deep the root from whence compassion grew. She was a slave, from such may captives claim a fellow feeling differing but in name. Still half unconscious, heedless of his wrath, again she ventured on the dangerous path, again his rage repelled, until arose that strife of thought, the source of woman's woes. 6. Meanwhile, long anxious, weary, still the same, rolled day and night. His soul could terror tame this fearful interval of doubt and dread, when every hour might doom him worse than dead, when every step that echoed by the gate might entering lead where axe and stake await, when every voice that grated on his ear might be the last that he could ever hear. Could terror tame, that spirit stern and high had proved unwilling as unfit to die. T'was worn, perhaps decayed, yet silent bore that conflict deadlier far than all before. The heat of fight, the hurry of the gale, leave scarce one thought inert enough to quail. But bound and fixed in fettered solitude, to pine the prey of every changing mood, to gaze on thine own heart and meditate irrevocable faults and coming fate. Too late the last to shun, the first to mend, to count the hours that struggle to thine end. With not a friend to animate and tell to other ears that death became thee well, around thee foes to forge the ready lie and blot life's latest scene with calumny. Before thee tortures, which the soul can dare, yet doubts how well the shrinking flesh may bear. But deeply feels a single cry would shame, to valor's praise thy last and dearest claim. The life thou leav'st below, denied above by kind monopolists of heavenly love, and more than doubtful paradise, thy heaven of earthly hope, thy loved one from thee riven. Such were the thoughts that outlaw must sustain, and govern pangs surpassing mortal pain. And those sustained he, boots it well or ill, since not to sink beneath is something still. 7. The first day passed. He saw not her Gulner, the second, third, and still she came not there. But what her words avouched, her charms had done, or else he had not seen another son. The fourth day rolled along, and with the night came storm and darkness in their mingling might. Oh, how he listened to the rushing deep, that ne'er till now so broke upon his sleep and his wild spirit wilder wishes sent, roused by the roar of his own element. Oft had he ridden on that winged wave, and loved its roughness for the speed it gave, and now its dashing echoed on his ear, a long-known voice, alas, too vainly near. Loud sung the wind above, and doubly loud, shook o'er his turret cell the thunder-cloud, and flashed the lightning by the latticed bar, to him more genial than the midnight star. Close to the glimmering grate he dragged his chain, and hoped that peril might not prove in vain. He raised his iron hand to heaven, and prayed one pitying flash to mar the form it made. His steel and impious prayer attract alike. The storm rolled onward and disdained to strike. Its peal waxed fainter, ceased, 
he felt alone, as if some faithless friend had spurned his groan. 8. The midnight passed, and to the massy door a light step came, it paused, it moved once more. Slow turns the grating bolt and sullen key, tis as his heart foreboded that fair she. Whate'er her sins, to him a guardian saint, and beauteous still as hermit's hope can paint. Yet changed since last within that cell she came, more pale her cheek, more tremulous her frame. On him she cast her dark and hurried eye, which spoke before her accents, Thou must die, yes, thou must die. There is but one resource, the last, the worst, if torture were not worse. Lady, I look to none. My lips proclaim what last proclaimed they, Conrad still the same. Why shouldst thou seek an outlaw's life to spare, and change the sentence I deserve to bear? Well have I earned, nor here alone, the meed of seed's revenge by many a lawless deed. Why should I seek? Because, O oh, didst thou not, Redeem my life from worse than slavery's lot? Why should I seek? Hath misery made thee blind To the fond workings of a woman's mind? And must I say, albeit my heart rebel With all that woman feels but should not tell? Because, despite thy crimes, that heart is moved. It feared thee, thanked thee, pitied, maddened, loved. Reply not, tell not now thy tale again. Thou lovest another, and I love in vain. Though fond as mine her bosom, form more fair, I rush through peril which she would not dare. If that thy heart to hers were truly dear, Were I thine own, thou wert not lonely here, An outlaw's spouse, and leave her lord to roam. What hath such gentle dame to do with home? But speak not now, o'er thine and o'er my head, Hangs the keen sabre by a single thread. If thou hast courage still, and wouldst be free, Receive this poniard, rise, and follow me. I, in my chains, my steps will gently tread, With these adornments o'er each slumbering head. Thou hast forgot, is this a garb for flight, Or is that instrument more fit for fight? Misdoubting Corsair, I have gained the guard, ripe for revolt and greedy for reward. A single word of mine removes that chain. Without some aid, how here could I remain? Well, since we met, hath sped my busy time, if in aught evil for thy sake the crime. The crime, tis none to punish those of seed, that hated tyrant Conrad, he must bleed. I see thee shudder, but my soul is changed, wronged, spurned, reviled, and it shall be avenged, accused of what till now my heart disdained, too faithful though to bitter bondage chained. Yes, smile, but he had little cause to sneer, I was not treacherous then, nor thou too dear. But he has said it, and the jealous well those tyrants teasing tempting to rebel deserve the fate their fretting lips foretell i never loved he bought me somewhat high since with me came a heart he could not buy i was a slave unmurmuring he hath said but for his rescue i with thee had fled twas false thou know'st but let such augurs rue their words are omens, insult renders true. Nor was thy respite granted to my prayer. This fleeting grace was only to prepare New torments for thy life and my despair. Mine too he threatens, but his dotage still Would fain reserve me for his lordly will. When wearier of these fleeting charms and me, There yawns the sack and yonder rolls the sea. What, am I then a toy for dotard's play, To wear but till the gilding frets away? I saw thee, loved thee, owe thee all, would save. 
if but to show how grateful is a slave. But had he not thus menaced fame and life, and well he keeps his oaths pronounced in strife, I still had saved thee, but the pasha spared. Now I am all thine own, for all prepared. Thou lovest me not, nor know'st, or but the worst. Alas, this love, that hatred are the first. O couldst thou prove my truth, thou wouldst not start, nor fear the fire that lights an eastern heart. Tis now the beacon of thy safety, now it points within the port a maynoat prow. But in one chamber where our path must lead, there sleeps, he must not wake, the presser's seed. Gulner, Gulner, I never felt till now my abject fortune withered fame so low. Seed is mine enemy, had swept my band from earth with ruthless but with open hand. And therefore came I, in my bark of war, to smite the smiter with the scimitar. Such is my weapon, not the secret knife, who spares a woman's, seeks not slumber's life. Thine saved I gladly, lady, not for this. Let me not deem that mercy shown amiss. Now fare thee well, more peace be with thy breast. Night wears apace, my last of earthly rest. Rest, rest, by sunrise must thy sinews shake, and thy limbs writhe around the ready stake. I heard the order, saw, I will not see. If thou wilt perish, I will fall with thee. My life, my love, my hatred, all below, are on this cast, corsair, tis but a blow. Without it flight were idle, how evade his sure pursuit, my wrongs too unrepaid, my youth disgraced, the long, long wasted years, one blow shall cancel with our future fears. But since the dagger suits thee less than brand, I'll try the firmness of a female hand. The guards are gained, one moment all were o'er, Corsair, we meet in safety or no more. If errs my feeble hand, the morning cloud will hover o'er thy scaffold and my shroud. 9. She turned and vanished ere he could reply, but his glance followed far with eager eye, and gathering as he could the links that bound his form to curl their length and curb their sound, since bar and bolt no more his steps preclude, he fast as fettered limbs allow pursued. T'was dark and winding, and he knew not where that passage led, nor lamp nor guard were there. He sees a dusky glimmering, shall he seek, or shun that ray so indistinct and weak? Chance guides his steps, a freshness seems to bear, full on his brow, as if from morning air. He reached an open gallery, on his eye gleamed the last star of night, the clearing sky. Yet scarcely heeded these, another light, from a lone chamber struck upon his sight. Towards it he moved, a scarcely closing door, revealed the ray within, but nothing more. With hasty step a figure outward passed, then paused and turned and paused, tis she at last. No poniard in that hand, nor sign of ill. Thanks to that softening heart she could not kill. Again he looked, the wildness of her eye starts from the day abrupt and fearfully. She stopped, threw back her dark, far-floating hair, that nearly veiled her face and bosom fair, as if she late had bent her leaning head above some object of her doubt or dread. They meet, upon her brow, unknown, forgot, her hurrying hand had left, t'was but a spot. Its hue was all he saw, and scarce withstood. O oh, slight but certain pledge of crime, tis blood! 10. He had seen battle, he had brooded lone, 
or promised pangs to sentenced guilt foreshown. He had been tempted, chastened, and the chain, yet on his arms might ever there remain. But ne'er from strife, captivity, remorse, from all his feelings in their inmost force, so thrilled, so shuddered every creeping vein, as now they froze before that purple stain. That spot of blood, that light but guilty streak, had banished all the beauty from her cheek. Blood he had viewed, could view unmoved, but then it flowed in combat or was shed by men. 11. Tis done, he nearly waked, but it is done. Corsair, he perished, thou art dearly won. All words would now be vain. Away, away! Our bark is tossing, tis already day. The few gained over, now are wholly mine, and these thy yet surviving band shall join. Anon my voice shall vindicate my hand, when once our sail forsakes this hated strand. 12. She clapped her hands, and through the gallery pour, equipped for flight her vassals, Greek and Moor. Silent but quick they stoop, his chains unbind. Once more his limbs are free as mountain wind. But on his heavy heart such sadness sat, as if they there transferred that iron weight. No words are uttered, at her sign a door reveals the secret passage to the shore. The city lies behind, they speed, they reach, the glad waves dancing on the yellow beach and Conrad following at her beck obeyed, nor cared he now if rescued or betrayed. Resistance were as useless as if seed, yet lived to view the doom his ire decreed. End of section 8 Read by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa, in October of 2022《セクション9 of The Corsair by George Gordon, Lord Byron. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto 3, stanzas 13 through 17. Embarked, the sail unfurled, the light breeze blew. How much had Conrad's memory to review! Sunk he in contemplation, till the cape where last he anchored reared its giant's shape. Ah! Since that fatal night, though brief the time, had swept an age of terror, grief, and crime. As its far shadow frowned above the mast, he veiled his face and sorrowed as he passed. He thought of all, Gonsalvo and his band, his fleeting triumph and his failing hand. He thought of her afar, his lonely bride. He turned and saw Gulner, the homicide. She watched his features till she could not bear their freezing aspect and averted air, and that strange fierceness, foreign to her eye, fell quenched in tears, too late to shed or dry. She knelt beside him, and his hand she pressed. Thou mayest forgive, though Allah's self detest. But for that deed of darkness, what wert thou? Reproach me, but not yet. Oh, spare me now! I am not what I seem. This fearful night, my brain bewildered, do not madden quite. If I had never loved, though less my guilt, thou hadst not lived to hate me, if thou wilt. She wrongs his thoughts. They more himself upbraid than her, though undesigned, the wretch he made. But speechless, all deep, dark, and unexpressed, They bleed within that silent cell, his breast. Still onward, fair the breeze, nor rough the surge, The blue waves sport around the stern they urge. Far on the horizon's verge appears a speck, A spot, a mast, a sail, an armed deck. Their little bark her men of watch descry, an ampler canvas woos the wind from high. She bears her down majestically near, Speed on her prow, and terror in her tear. 
A flash is seen, the ball beyond their bow, Booms harmless, hissing in the deep below. Up rose keen Conrad from his silent trance, A long, long absent gladness in his glance. "'Tis mine, my blood-red flag, again, again. I'm not all deserted on the main. They own the signal, answer to the hail, Hoist out the boat at once, and slacken sail. "'Tis Conrad, Conrad, shouting from the deck, Command nor duty could their transport check. With light alacrity and gaze of pride, They view him mount once more his vessel's side. A smile relaxing in each rugged face, Their arms can scarce forbear a rough embrace. He, half forgetting danger and defeat, Returns their greeting as a chief may greet, Rings with a cordial grasp Anselmo's hand, And feels he can yet conquer and command. These greetings o'er, the feeling set o'er flow, Yet grieve to win him back without a blow. They sailed prepared for vengeance. Had they known, a woman's hand secured that deed her own. She were their queen. Less scrupulous are they than haughty Conrad, how they win their way. With many an asking smile and wondering stare, they whisper round and gaze upon Gulner. And her at once above, beneath her sex, whom blood appalled not, their regards perplex. To Conrad turns her faint imploring eye. She drops her veil and stands in silence by. Her arms are meekly folded on that breast, which, Conrad safe, to fate resigned the rest. Though worse than frenzy could that bosom fill, extreme in love or hate, in good or ill, the worst of crimes had left her woman still. This Conrad marked and felt, ha, ah, could he less? Hate of that deed, but grief for her distress. What she had done, no tears can wash away, and heaven must punish on its angry day. But it was done, he knew, what e'er her guilt, for him that poignard smote, that blood was spilt, and he was free and she, for him, had given her all on earth, and more than that in heaven. And now he turned him to that dark-eyed slave, whose brow was bowed beneath the glance he gave, who now seemed changed and humbled, faint and meek, but varying oft the color of her cheek to deeper shades of paleness, all its red, that fearful spot which stained it from the dead. He took that hand, it trembled, now too late, so soft in love, so wildly nerved in hate. He clasped that hand, it trembled, and his own had lost its firmness, and his voice its tone. Gulner! But she replied not. Dear Gulner! She raised her eye, her only answer there. At once she sought and sunk in his embrace. If he had driven her from that resting place, his had been more or less than mortal heart. But, good or ill, it bade her not depart. Perchance, but for the bodings of his breast, his latest virtue then had joined the rest. Yet even Medora might forgive the kiss that asked from form so fair no more than this. The first the last that frailty stole from faith, to lips where love had lavished all his breath, to lips whose broken sighs and fragrance fling, as he had fanned them freshly with his wing. End of section 9「Section 10 of The Corsair by George Gordon, Lord Byron – this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto three, stanza eighteen to twenty four. Eighteen. They gain by twilight hour their lonely isle, 
to them the very rocks appear to smile the haven hums with many a cheering sound the beacons blaze their wonted stations round the boats are darting o'er the curly bay and sportive dolphins bend them through the spray even the hoarse seabird's shrill discordant shriek greets like the welcome of his tuneless beak beneath each lamp that through its lattice gleams their fancy paints the friends that trim the beams oh what can sanctify the joys of home like hope's gay glance from ocean's troubled foam nineteen the lights are high on beacon and from bower and midst them comrade seeks medora's tower he looks in vain tis strange and all remark amid so many hers alone is dark tis strange of yore its welcome never failed nor now perchance extinguished only veiled with the first boat descends he for the shore and looks impatient on the lingering oar oh for a wing beyond the falcon's flight to bear him like an arrow to that height with the first pause the resting rowers gave he waits not looks not leaps into the wave strives through the surge bestrides the beach and high ascends the path familiar to his eye he reached his turret door he paused no sound broke from within and all was night around he knocked and loudly footstep nor reply announced that any heard or deemed him nigh he knocked but faintly for his trembling hand refused to aid his heavy heart's demand the portal opens tis a well-known face but not the form he panted to embrace its lips are silent twice his own essayed and failed to frame the question they delayed he snatched the lamp its light will answer all it quits his grasp expiring in the fall he would not wait for that reviving ray as soon could he have lingered there for day but glimmering through the dusky corridor another checkers o'er the shadowed floor his steps the chamber gain his eyes behold all that his heart believed not yet foretold twenty he turned not spoke not sunk not fixed his look and set the anxious frame that lately shook he gazed how long we gaze despite of pain and know but dare not own we gaze in vain in life itself she was so still and fair that death with gentler aspect withered there and the cold flowers her colder hand contained in that last grasp as tenderly were strained as if she scarcely felt but feigned a sleep and made it almost mockery yet to weep the long dark lashes fringed her lids of snow and veiled thought shrinks from all that lurked below oh o'er the eye death most exerts his might and hurls the spirit from her throne of light sinks those blue orbs in that long last eclipse but spares as yet the charms around her lips yet yet they seem as they forbore to smile and wished repose but only for a while but the white shroud and each extended tress long fair but spread in utter lifelessness which late the sport of every summer wind escaped the baffled wreath that strove to bind these and the pale pure cheek became the buyer but she is nothing wherefore is he here twenty one he asked no question all were answered now by the first glance on that still marble brow 
it was enough she died what wrecked it how the love of youth the hope of better years the source of softest wishes tenderest fears the only living thing he could not hate was reft at once and he deserved his fate but did not feel it less the good explore for peace those realms where guilt can never soar the proud the wayward who have fixed below their joy and find this earth enough for woe lose in that one their all perchance a mite but who in patience parts with all delight full many a stoic eye and aspect stern mask hearts where grief hath little left to learn and many a withering thought lies hid not lost in smiles that least befit who wear them most twenty two by those that deepest feel are ill expressed the indistinctness of the suffering breast where a thousand thoughts begin to end in one which seeks from all the refuge found in none no words suffice the secret soul to show and truth denies all eloquence to woe on conrad's stricken soul exhaustion pressed and stupor almost lulled it into rest so feeble now his mother's softness crept to those wild eyes which like an infant's wept it was the very weakness of his brain which thus confessed without relieving pain none saw his trickling tears perchance if seen that useless flood of grief had never been nor long they flowed he dried them to depart in helpless hopeless brokenness of heart the sun goes forth but conrad's day is dim and the night cometh ne'er to pass from him there is no darkness like the cloud of mind on grief's vain eye the blindest of the blind which may not dare not see but turns aside to blackish shade nor will endure a guide twenty three his heart was formed for softness warped to wrong betrayed too early and beguiled too long each feeling pure as falls the dropping dew within the grot like that had hardened too less clear perchance its earthly trials past but sunk and chilled and petrified at last yet tempest where and lightning cleaves the rock if such his heart so shattered it the shock there grew one flower beneath its rugged brow though dark the shade it sheltered save till now the thunder came that bolt hath blasted both the granite's firmness and the lily's growth the gentle plant hath left no leaf to tell its tale but shrunk and withered where it fell and of its cold protector black and round but shivered fragments on the barren ground twenty four tis morn to venture on his lonely hour few dare though now anselmo sought his tower he was not there nor seen along the shore ere night alarmed their isle is traversed o'er another morn another bids them seek and shout his name till echo waxeth weak mount grotto cavern valley searched in vain they find on shore a sea-boat's broken chain their hope revives they follow o'er the main tis idle all moons roll on moons away and conrad comes not came not since that day nor trace nor tidings of his doom declare where lives his grief or perished his despair long mourned his band whom none could mourn beside and fair the monument they gave his bride 
for him they raised not the recording stone his death yet dubious deeds too widely known he left a corsair's name to other times linked with one virtue and a thousand crimes end of section ten read by alan mapstone end of the corsair by george gordon lord byron